If you have your Bibles, turn with me to um, Matthew 28 and verses 16 to 20. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Praise you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor last week shared the Great Commission is for all believers. He shared, he said, the church is not a leisure boat, but a rescue boat. Saving people from the, out of their sins. The Great Commission is a commandment, according to John 14, 21. The Great Commission is the mission for the church. Help us, Lord, this morning to align with your mission. Amen. We've been on our own mission. How many of you have been on your mission? I know I've been on my mission. And our mission is work, 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 get there, get there, pay your bond, get there, buy another car, get done, you know, get enough money for retirement. You know, that is our mission. But there's a great commission. There's a commission that's greater than your mission. And we've neglected it. And I'm guilty of that myself. Amen. So this morning, let's go to Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Bad on those ones, right? I mean, to see Jesus after he died. Now, just context. Jesus had just died. This is the period where he has risen and he's met with his disciples on a few occasions now. And they've seen him over those 40, uh, was it 40 or 50 days? 50 days, right? Up to Pentecost, from, from Passover to Pentecost, 50 days. And they've seen him over that, over that, over that period. More than 500 witnesses saw him. And from scripture, it appears that he's met with them almost every second day. It was almost like he, he was there for, for that whole 50 days. Anyway, they don't give us much insight into Jesus must have told them, come in such and such a day, I'm going to meet you on that mountain. So from the scripture, we can see that's what happened. So obviously some that weren't with them when Jesus said it, obviously doubted. Uh, um, and, and the scripture is so true to it. I mean, if you were going to lie about it, you wouldn't say there was some that doubted. You would just keep it positive, right? But the scripture is so open and honest. And Jesus came and spoke to them and saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All means nothing excluding not just a little bit not just 90 percent not just some but all authority now this makes me think of matthew 4 4 where jesus meets where jesus is in the wilderness and he meets satan and satan takes him up into a high mountain what a coincidence they're on a mountain satan took him to a, on a mountain and said to him all these kingdoms will i give you and yet Jesus comes and meets them on a mountain and says to them, all authority. So he says, all those kingdoms that the devil had, all of those things, I'm now in charge. Because the devil said to him, they were handed to me. They have been given to me. And you know where he got them from? Adam. Because when Adam sinned, the Bible says in Romans 5, Who's read Romans 5? Go read Romans 5. It's the most, it's one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. Romans 5 is awesome. Romans 5 is, wow, I was reading it this morning. I was like, wow, Lord, why didn't, didn't I see this before? I mean, it says through one man, sin came upon everyone. It says, even those that didn't sin after the similitude of Adam, sin came on them. So just the fact that you're born, you were a sinner. You didn't do anything. Before I was saved, I could never understand. Why do they say Jesus died for the sin of the world? I wasn't even there. I didn't even sin. You know, you tell a little lie here and you do a little wrong there and there. 
And, and you think, you know, but, you know, was that so bad? But later I understood what it meant. Because we all were in Adam. So when Adam sinned, our genes, the genealogy, our DNA, all of that was corrupted with sin. And so when Jesus came, the Bible says he redeemed us. To redeem means to, uh, to, to redeem. So we were, Adam was deemed, but God had to go and redeem. So to redeem means to buy back. So what was his, he lost it. So he had to go and buy that back and bring it back. And not only bring it back, but he had to get jurisdictional authority. He had to get power. He had to get legislation he had to get the 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 command that you can operate in this realm and so he says all power all power has been given unto me all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth and he says now go therefore and make disciples of all nations cross the borders Cross the ethnic boundaries. Cross the cultural boundaries. Go to every nation. Go to every people. And make disciples. Baptizing them. We had baptism this morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. What a statement that is. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 and 8. And I want to continue with the Great Commission and subtitle it to be a witness. To be a witness. And Acts chapter 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. So he says to them, and I believe this is just before Pentecost. So it could be a, a, a later date in terms of when the Holy Spirit came. But nonetheless, it's aligned with the Great Commission. It's part of the Great Commission. And he says to them, go be a witness. So this morning I want to speak of the witness that you and I need to be for Jesus. I was at the function yesterday and, and, and this gentleman was 70 years and his family arranged the function for him and honored him. What an honor. And when I spoke to him and he said to me he worked for a mining company and during apartheid they were not allowed to come to work with their cars. There was the rules of the company. No black person must come with a car. And he was the first one to come with his car. And from there, everyone came with their cars. But he said these words. He said, a white Afrikaner guy witnessed to me. And I got saved. And my whole family over the years got saved. And God changed their lives. And I was listening to all of them, uh, one after each other, coming up and testifying of what God has done and giving glory to God. And I looked at it and I said, during apartheid, one African, uh, Afrikaner guy came and witnessed. And, and, and if I look at his family, he had five or six siblings. And it's their children and their children. And they're all serving the Lord. One guy. One testimony, one witness of Jesus Christ. Look at that. The witness of Jesus Christ is so powerful. What is the Great Commission? It is Christ's command authorizing his disciples to go into the world. If you didn't know what the Great Commission is, now you know. It is Christ's command to go into the world and to make disciples, authorizing you dedicating you, uh, 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 commanding you, uh, uh, equipping you, uh, anointing you, uh, uh, um, um, setting you up, uh, giving you jurisdictional power, giving you authority. Go into all the world and preach to all. Be my witness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize all those who believe. Teach them to observe 
Sorry, I thought the slide is up there. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. Okay, there we go. Amen. Thank you, media team. All right, so if you missed what I said, it's up there. Hallelujah. So the witness is so important for us. And I want to focus more on this witness. I want to talk about the witness in my life of how Jesus changed my life as well. I want to give you a few examples. Because you know, there's nothing like having a personal witness, a personal experience. Once it happens to you, you know that you know that you know. They cannot change your mind. They cannot tell you it didn't happen. They cannot convince you otherwise. You know Jesus saved you. You know you were on your way to hell. You know you were in darkness. You know you were in bondage. You know there was no other way. You know there was nowhere to turn. You know who came to your rescue. You had experience of that. You have personal experience of that. Nevertheless, in Acts 1 and 22, Peter says, we have, to replace Ju uh, we have to replace Judas. And we have to bear witness of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection. And they go and they get and they bring Matthias in. And Matthias, according to Peter's statement in that chapter, these disciples, pastor, was there all the time. I thought they were just selected from, you know, the, the other people. They were part. So uh, it wasn't just the 12 and the women that was with Jesus. There was many others that were with them. But he chose out of them the 12. And they selected Matthias. And he became a witness to the resurrection. And then Pentecost came. And the Holy Ghost came upon them. And fire came. And the power of God came from heaven. And set upon them like tongues of fire. And they burst out of that room. And they spoke in tongues. And the, and the people of Jerusalem at that time were made up of foreigners. And various other peoples and languages. Because it was Pentecost. They all would come. Every festival. Every Jewish feast. They would come into Jerusalem to come and worship. To come and pay homage. To come and do what is required quiet on the feast days and to do their, their rituals and these people heard them speak in all these languages and they say what is this what is going on and Peter jumped up bold full of the Holy Ghost and began to preach to them and Peter said in Acts 2 32 God has raised Jesus to life and we are all witnesses and he begins to witness to them you know, the Bible wasn't just written. The Bible was written. is an accurate historical document. It was written by the eyewitnesses in the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. How can someone that came 700 years later tell us that it is wrong? Tell us it's been altered. Do you know there's 25,000 copies of every book in the Bible? If you changed one, you had to change all of them. And how is that possible? If I change one verse here, I have to go back and change every Bible. We had the actual eyewitnesses. They walked with Jesus. They ate with him. They talked with him. They moved with him. They saw him die. They saw him after the resurrection. They spoke with him. He said, man, handle me, touch me. So they were accurate witnesses. They had no reason to lie. You know, this one guy says, the reason I know the Bible is true, because the Watergate scandal in the U.S. that caused President Nixon to resign, there were 12 men implicated in that. And he said it took them, in a few months, they spilled the beans. He said, but here we have 12 men that died, and none of them, not one of them, on his deathbed turned around and said, you know what, that was a lie. That wasn't true. It really wasn't like that. They all died. Who would die for a lie? Who would sacrifice for a lie? Who would give your life for a lie? Who would be beaten up for a lie? They were the witnesses of this gospel. The last command of the Lord Jesus must become our first priority. The church has gone asleep. And we have not been the witness. There's hundreds of people that die every day. And we say, ah, shame. Oh, so sorry to hear. Did that person make it? 
Did that person know? I, I mentioned in the first service that uh, 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 um, this Muslim guy in Egypt said to his neighbor, he said, I'm living 12 years next to you. Not once did you take me to your church. And he said to this guy, take me to your church. And this guy organized and he didn't actually take him to his church, took him to another church, which I, uh, from what he's saying is a Pentecostal church. And the guy got there and he saw what was happening and they gave him a Bible. But his intention was to mock this guy. His intention was to, to ridicule him. To make a whole big joke out of this church thing. He says because all they see on TV is Hollywood. Is guns, bikinis, murders, robberies, car chases. And they thought that's Christianity. And so he was ready to mock this guy. And he, they gave him a Bible and he went home. And he said he read this Bible. And, and he was still, you know, in that mocking spirit about it. And he said he prayed. And, and he said, God, is this, is Jesus really God? And he said the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord said, yes. He said the power of God came on him. He asked forgiveness. He received the Lord. The love of God filled him to overflow. He read that Bible day and night. He didn't put it down. He read that whole Bible. He went out of his room. He couldn't contain himself. He preached to everyone he saw. He said in the taxi he would preach to everyone. They probably have similar to our taxis. He said he preached to everyone in that taxi. And he said behind him was a man that kept doing this. And he said, when he got out, this man ran behind him and said, Hey, I'm an imam, and I tried to slap you. I tried to hit you, but my arms were bound. I couldn't get loose. Hmm? And he began to minister to this man. He said he would minister to 10 people a day, Pastor. He said if, there was, if, if he was at 8, he'd take a taxi quickly and, and witness to the taxi driver. That's 9, and drop off and take another one coming back and witness to that one, and that would be 10. And he said he wouldn't, and this taxi driver said, no, I'll only believe it if a Muslim gets saved. He said, here's my ID. See on my ID, because they get religion on their ID. He said, there's, there I'm a Muslim. And this guy went and reported him to the, to the federal police or the secret police. They came, they locked him up. He was in prison for eight or nine months. He said he was in a dark cell. He said he didn't worry what they did to him. All he was happy, he could spend time with Jesus. He could pray. And you know, the prisoners would ask him through the cell door, hey, what's going on? Why are you in solitary? Why don't they, you know, what's happened? What, what crime did you commit? He says, I was a Muslim and I became a Christian. And he witnessed to every prisoner. And the prisoners would come there daily outside the door and he'd pray and he'd preach for them. And he tell them about Jesus. And this, the security police heard this. And they took him out. They said, hey, that man is preaching to everyone even though he's locked up. Hmm? See, when we have a witness, the power comes. He says, you shall receive power. The definition of a witness is someone who has a personal experience that they can describe. If I speak about my own experience, then I am reliable, then I am a reliable source, a reliable witness. I mean, I think of that blind guy that was born blind. Jesus heals him. He, he, he goes about, he's rejoicing. He tells them, so the Pharisees call him. They say, hey, uh, they call his mother and father to verify, was this guy blind? They call the neighbors. They all say, yeah, this is the guy. So they go on and question, questioning him. So the mother and father says, hey, ask him. He's of age. He can tell. He can talk for himself. So this guy says, I don't know about you, but all I know, I was blind, but now I can see. Hmm? He had his personal testimony of Jesus Christ. In Acts 8.25, Peter testifies to Cornelius. No, sorry. Peter testifies to, to the Samaritans and he says to them, and when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. I mean, didn't Jesus just give them that command like yesterday? 
I mean, this is like a few chapters. I don't know how many months transpired between those chapters. If maybe a year, I don't even think so. I mean, these guys were like on it. They didn't sit at home. They didn't wait to say, hey, let's this. No, they were moving. I mean, Philip went down there. Philip preached. Miracles, signs and wonders flowed from his hands. He, he went past that chariot. The Holy Spirit said, get up on that chariot. Minister to this guy. And that guy was reading Isaiah. And he couldn't understand what he was reading. But he was reading about the crucifixion. About how Jesus gives his life. How the, sh how, how the sheep goes to the slaughter. You know, and, and he said, who's this man speaking? And Philip answers him and he, and he shows him and he points out to Christ. And this man says, stop the chariot. Here's water. Let's be baptized. I mean, they didn't play. They, had, they took this thing serious. They stopped immediately there. There wasn't a, wait, let me just get, I didn't bring my old clothes. No. He said, let's get baptized now, here and now. Let's get it done. Let's be a witness. Now imagine that guy went back to Ethiopia because he said that guy was the treasurer of the queen. He was quite a powerful guy. That guy went back to Ethiopia. He must have witnessed to somebody. Somebody must have got saved. And that person must have witnessed to somebody. And somebody witnessed to somebody. So God alone knows how many people from that witness became a Christian. In Acts 9, we meet Paul the Apostle. He gets letters from the high priest. And he goes... To, to persecute the Christians. He was there with Stephen. He held the coats of the man that, that, that stoned Stephen. That killed him. And while Stephen was stoned. He looked up and he saw, he saw Jesus on the right hand. And when they heard him say that. They got even more mad. But he said Lord lay not this charge against them. I mean what kind of people are these? That, that would stand and do something like that. That would look at you and say Lord forgive them. They don't know what they do. And Paul goes and he's on his way and lightning hits him or a big light and he falls from his horse. And a voice speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Lord, who are you? Who are you that's speaking to me? And the voice said, I am Jesus. And Paul says, what do you want me to do? And he says, go into Damascus. It will be told you what to do. And Paul goes into Damascus and he's blind for three days. And he sits there praying. And the Lord speaks to Ananias and says to him, go, there's a man there. His name is Saul. Go prophesy over him and tell him what he must do for me. That he must be a witness and he must bear many things for my name's sake and this guy said but lord we heard of this guy this guy put many in prison this guy's dangerous and the lord said don't worry go he's a chosen vessel a chosen vessel and not many verses later the bible says in acts 9 20 straight away he preached christ you know while while, while that guy was talking to me says let's get baptized so he got baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, spent spend some time there, and not even many days later, he started preaching. He was so filled with the love of God. He was so filled with the Spirit of God. He was so consumed with the Holy Spirit. He didn't hang. He didn't play. He didn't say, hey, let's recover. Let's think about this. No, he didn't even consider that, hey, I worked for the high priest. Hey, they're going to kill me. He didn't even bother. He didn't even worry about that. He began to preach the gospel. It wasn't long. Those guys said, you know what? This guy, we need to take him out. And they had to let him down on a basket. And he escaped and he went to Jerusalem. And even the Christians, when he got to Jerusalem, were scared of him. They said, hey, this guy, we're not sure. Maybe he's undercover. And then Barnabas comes and Barnabas says, no, this man is genuine. This man, is a, this man testify boldly about Jesus Christ. Peter then, further Peter goes to Joppa. Peter raises a woman from the dead. Peter prays for a lame guy and he gets healed. And he testifies about Jesus. And then he has this dream, a vision about this food. And being Jewish, they don't eat non-kosher food. They only eat certain foods. They don't even step into the house of a non-Jew. I mean, that was just sacrilege. That was just, the tradition was so strong. They wouldn't even dare do that. And God shows him. And anyway, God shows him that eat and kill. He says, not so, Lord. And the Lord said, I've sanctified it. Nevertheless, the vision meant two guys came. And they said, look, we need you to come with us. An uh, angel appeared to our master. And he said, we must call for you to tell you. Uh, you must come tell us what we must do. And Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, prays for them. And while he prays for them, the Holy Ghost falls upon them. 
and they get saved and they speak in tongues. You know, another guy, Pastor, I was listening to a while back. He said at, at ORU University, they did a study on someone's brain that spoke in tongues. And they found that their brain would produce additional assistance for the immune system up to 40% by speaking in tongues. I was listening to another minister. He said he speaks in tongues for an hour every day. In Acts 18, 9 and 10, the Lord speaks to Paul in a vision by night and says, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set thee to hurt, for I have much people in this city. In Acts 17, Paul gets to Thessalonica. They preach the gospel. The, the people believe, but the, the Jews get angry, and they cause a big uproar. And they say these words, they say, Here are these men that have turned the whole world upside down, and they have come here also. We need to turn the world upside down. Upside down with the gospel. Because the world is upside down, and we think it's normal. It's not normal. We need to turn it the other way around. I mean, if people can, can, can give themselves pronouns and not be shy and go out in public and tell who they think they are and who they identify with, why can we not be a testimony? Why can't we testify about Jesus Christ? Why is our gospel reduced to what we have, who we are, where we stay, how much money we have, how much education we have, what is our status? Why is our gospel standing in the twilight? Our gospel is real. We were delivered. We were set free we were evangelized we saw the light the light came on in our lives we were delivered we were redeemed our names is written in the lamb's book of life totally lost you on my notes So Paul continues, he, then the disciples say to Paul, okay, get out of town quickly. Paul gets out of town, he goes to Berea. He gets there hardly a day or two, he preaches in their synagogue. He preaches, people get saved, signs and wonders follow. They hear from this, hey, that guy is over there again. They go over there, they cause the same ruckus. They say to Paul, leave. Paul goes to, 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 to Athens. Paul gets in Athens. On Mars Hill, he preaches. And he converses with them. And he tells them about the unknown God. And he explains to them how Jesus Christ arose. And from there, he goes to Corinth. And that's where the Lord appears to uh, The Lord speaks to me in a vision. He says, in this city, don't worry. Nobody will hurt you here. Hold not back, but speak. Witness about me. And Paul goes forth and he witnesses. Our testimony should turn our communities from darkness to light. Our testimony should turn our people around. Our testimony should be more. But we want to first, you know what is our problem? We want to first make it socially. We want to first make it. We want to first look good. We want to first drive good. We want to first wear good. We want to first be good. And then we want to testify. Jesus didn't call us to testify when all of those things is in our lives. He called us to testify about who he is, about what he's done, about the name of Jesus, about how his grace has come into our lives as a free gift and how that grace is coming to save us. We need to turn the world upside down with the gospel. I heard of a, a small little girl that witnessed to a satanic guy. And this guy said, when this woman witnessed to him, she was small and timid. He was so mighty and powerful according to him. He said every demonic spirit he tried to summon ran away. They left. He stood there. He couldn't slap her. He couldn't move. He stood there yet to witness. And then he realized if this girl has got more power than what I've got, there must be something about her Jesus that she's talking about. And he got saved and he got delivered and he got set free. You know, when I was, before I was saved, I was in a dark space. 
I was in a terrible state and condition. My life was a mess. I was either going to look at prison or death. I lived in a community that was violent. I lived a violent life. And I had to survive and do whatever I, I thought I had to do to survive. And one day I was sitting and I heard a church and they had an open air meeting. I do not know this woman. I do not know this church. I don't recall their faces. But I heard this woman say, Jesus saves. I didn't hear anything else. A few days later, I stood at the same place at 2 a.m., afraid to go home because I'm ducking and diving. The cops is looking for me. And I stood there and I said, Lord, I heard that woman say, Jesus saves. If you really save, come into my life. Come and save me. And save me, he did. Jesus is true. Jesus is really a savior. Jesus is really a redeemer. Jesus is true to his word. He's not a man that he should lie. He did. He came and he saved me. And the other day I explained. The day I went and I gave my heart to Jesus. And when I left that flat and I walked down the street. I, I felt like I'm lifting up my hands. I'm free. I'm light. The weight is gone. The scales has fallen off. I can see clearly. I walk down. I'm crying. I'm full of the love of God. I know that I know that I'm saved. I know that if I die right now. I'm going to heaven you couldn't convince me any otherwise you couldn't pay me for to 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 see it differently the great commission you have it in you you have the witness you have the witness you have the power don't think you need adequate words don't think you need to be eloquent. Don't think you need a good vocabulary. Don't think you need scientific and great formulas and great speech. And be an be a authoritarian and a good teacher and an evangelist and a great preacher. And, and if, having studied the word, no, all you need is your testimony. All you need is to tell what Jesus done for you. Because there's someone like you. There's someone at your level. There's someone that has experienced what you've experienced. So the Lord speaks to Paul. He says, hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall do you harm in this city. I have many people here. And Paul goes and he speaks. And later he writes in Corinthians and he says, when I came here, I did not come with eloquent words. I did not come with fancy descriptions, but I came in the demonstration and the power of Christ. He came healing. He came delivering. He came setting the captive free. And they saw what this man witnessed about is real. They saw what this man spoke about because he preached Jesus. And when you preach Jesus, you preach of how God anointed Jesus Christ. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil and that's the gospel they preach how Jesus saved how Jesus healed how Jesus delivered how Jesus brings eternal life how this free gift of grace has come upon us and if we accept it all our sins is forgiven in Acts 22 and 15 he says for thou shalt be a witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And Acts 20, 23, 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. So thou must bear witness at Rome also. So Paul goes on this missionary journey. And Paul comes back to Jerusalem. And he goes and he prays in the temple and, and, and he, he testifies of Jesus. And they say, here's that guy that's turned the whole world upside down. Here's the guy. Let's catch him now. Let's, let's nail him now. And they, and they get together and they plan to harm and hurt him. Anyway, they take Paul captive. They lock him up and Paul goes to trial. And in his trial, he gives a witness that demonstrated the power of Christ. 
And the Bible says he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. And the whole Sanhedrin was there. And the whole Jewish council was there. And the Pharisees were there. And he said he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. Now that their general tongue was Aramaic and Greek. But when he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, only the very learned scholars had the Hebrew language. And they sat even more still. And they kept the more quiet, the Bible said. And he began to tell them how he was cast from his horse. How he fell. How the voice spoke to him. How he was saved how he was delivered and his life from there on and they got so mad they started fighting with each other and and the roman guard had to pull him out in acts 26 and 14 and just likely before that the lord says i did read that scripture where the lord says you must go unto rome and paul appeals unto caesar in Acts 26, 14, he meets King Agrippa. And he begins to share the same testimony. And he begins to witness of what Jesus has done in his life. There's nothing more powerful than your own witness. Than your own testimony. You don't need a big evangelist to stand out there and preach. If you cannot witness, bring them to church. Invite them to church. The same Muslim guy, he was in prison eight or nine months. Pastor, he said he had to use a coffee can that was cut out and he had to put his shoes on either side as a toilet to sit on it. That didn't deter him. He didn't get, you know, bogged down and say, hey, since I'm serving the Lord, it's so bad. Since I'm serving the Lord, it's so hard. We know it's a hard road. We know the devil will come against you. We know it's difficult. But this man rejoiced the more. This man was so full of the love of God. This man was beaming and overflowing. It didn't matter where you put him. It didn't matter how you suppressed him. He just kept pushing. He just kept pushing. He just kept testifying to the point where they said to him, No, let's release this guy. Let him go. He said he went to the U.S. And when he was there, he, he went on various missions and continued to preach the word. He said he couldn't understand the Christianity of there, that we, we all just come to church on a Sunday. He gets up in the morning and he goes out there and he preaches the word and he testifies about Jesus. A long story short, he says one day his son was one year old, fell in the swimming pool and the boy died. And his wife phoned him to say, hey, your son is dead. And he came rushing and he, and he hugged his wife and they both wept and the boy was lying in a body bag zipped up already. And he heard the Lord say, Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He said, Jesus healed the same as he healed those years, the same he can heal today. He's the same. He's forever and ever the same. He doesn't change. He was and he is and he is to come. He was dead and is alive forevermore. He's the great I am and the Prince of Peace. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Bright and the Morning Star, the Lily of the Valley and the Rose of Sharon. He's our great I am. He's the Lord our savior he's our redeemer he's our light in darkness he's a friend that stick it closer than a brother yeah. and he said he went and he prayed for this boy and this boy started screaming in the bag and they unzipped him and took him out and the doctor said the doctor in the hospital brought a bowl of water said this is how much water came out of his lungs i don't think this boy is going to make it he's probably going to be a vegetable and this guy's english he couldn't understand what does vegetable got to do with the boy and they had to explain to him what they mean and he prayed there and then and he said the next few days he came back and he said when the boy's eyes opened he immediately recognized his father and screamed and that boy is healed totally totally healed yeah. another iranian lady quickly just to finish off i'm way over time iranian lady said she was stopped and, and a colleague of mine sent me this clip and I was listening to it and we both agreed. We said, wow, you know, our Christianity is all about my needs, my finances, my kids, how it goes during the day. The Lord must open a door, business, this, that. Says this lady stood and they said to her, here is prison. If you say you're a Christian, 
all your family, all your bank accounts, all your belongings, everything you will lose right now. If you say you're Muslim, there's the door you go right through. And she looked the guy in his eyes and said, I'm a Christian. And she witnessed to this guy. And that made me think about our Christianity that we serve God with. And some of us, even myself at times, we serve God for things. Because God can meet our needs. God can prosper us. God can do this. God can do that. But do we do what he's commanded and commissioned us to do? We have a witness this morning. Hallelujah.